Welcome back. In the last video, I got the new short block assembled. Now I can move on to assembling the rest of the engine. The first things to go on are the new head gaskets. These are a multi-layered steel that I ordered from Kometic. They're a bit thicker than stock to compensate for the material that was taken off the block and the heads, as well as the higher compression pistons. Hopefully the intake manifold and exhaust header still fits, since the mounting holes are slightly farther apart, but we'll find out later. I got the heads dropped in place, and I reinsert all the valve buckets where they originally came from. So I had the machine shop do a full valve job, which includes grinding the valve stem until the clearances to the cams are in spec. You've got to do this because when you grind the valve seat down, it moves the valve closer to the cams, decreasing the clearances. Mine were also worn out anyways, so they were already too tight. Next up, I install the washers and nuts for the head studs, making sure to grease them properly. Then I get torqued down in three stages until I hit 90 foot-pounds. I go back and re-lubricate the buckets with assembly lube just to be safe. And the cams get dropped in, making sure it's all clean and looped up. Then I decide to double check the valve clearances, and that's where I find some trouble. One of the heads has inconsistent measurements. Some of the clearances are too large, which isn't a huge deal, but some are under as well. The valve clearances are too tight, the valve isn't able to dissipate heat properly, and it can overheat and burn a valve. So I can't really run it like this. My only choice is to take them all out and measure the buckets to see if I can swap some around, or if I have to buy some new ones. Unfortunately, due to the way these heads are designed, you have to swap a whole new lifter bucket in place to change the clearances. The machine shop can grind down the valve stems, but most people don't have a way to do this on their own. It also only works for increasing valve clearances. So I take my micrometers out and I measure all the buckets that are out of spec, writing down the details in my notebook as I go along. It looked like one bucket had been ground down, so I'll be replacing this one. While I waited for the order to be ready, I installed the new oil cooler. There were some metal fragments in the old one, and they can't really be cleaned, so I had to cough up 300 bucks for a new one. This also isn't only a cooler. It's meant to help heat the oil and maintain it at a consistent temperature. Some people delete this, but I'm keeping it, especially because I live in a colder climate. Then I install the old baffle that's been cleaned up, followed by an upgraded oil pickup that's much stronger. The original ones can crack and break, which can cause oil starvation. I messed up my old oil pan by using brake cleaner on it, but it was all rusty anyway, so I'm waiting for a new one to arrive. New valve buckets were in, so I installed the cam caps and checked the clearances again. I got new buckets for some of these. And after a while of swapping around some uh, some of the old ones, putting new ones in, the clearances are like okay. Some of the exhausts are kind of tight on a 13 thou feeler gauge, and that's about as low as you're supposed to be, but you know what, I think that's fine. It's, it's in spec, should be okay. I, wanna, I wanted to run slightly higher exhaust clearances, but you know, I bought buckets that were supposed to be shorter to make a larger clearance, and it didn't really wind up changing very much. Uh, even though I, you know, shot to be right in the middle of like the 14.5, thou range, I was still at like 13 for the exhaust, so who knows, maybe they'll wear in just a little bit um, and, you know, settle in a little bit better so they can uh, increase those clearances a little bit. When I was reassembling the other heads, I noticed some grit in the oil passages. Upon closer inspection, I found out that this was actually sandblasting grit. The machine shop had blasted my heads, which was great, but they didn't clean them properly. So apart came all the heads, and while I was at it, I noticed I had a sticking valve too. 
brought them back to the machine shop, making sure to remind them of their mistakes. Okay, so it's a while later, and I finally have my cylinder heads back. They should be good to go at this point in time. They went over them again, they fixed the sticking valve, they cleaned out all the oil passages as best they could. So at this point, now it's just going to go all back together again, and we're going to get this thing properly timed. So, after all of that, the heads could go back on yet again. Cams went back in, followed by the cam caps. And I'm going to make sure I put the cams in the right side of the engine. The most important thing is to go super light around these channels here and to not clog those because these are like drain ports so any, any oil that gets built up behind the seal here will be able to leak back through here and drain. If these are clogged it'll overpressurize the seal and it'll start leaking. So you can't actually create a leak by using too much sealant. The heads are now on for good, I hope, and now it's time for all the stuff on top of the engine. First are the TGVs. These create turbulence to help cold starts. I thought about removing the flaps to gain some power, but decided not to. Then there's some cool and PCV lines that go on top. This first one is for the water pump. This big thing is a coolant crossover pipe which goes to the coolant parts in the block. Then there's another pipe which is partially for the PCB system. It's tucked in among the EGR junk, some of which has to be installed first. My new oil pan was ready to install next. This doesn't use a gasket, rather some more of the sealant which is oh so fun to work with. I moved back to the cams and hammered in the seals. Then the sprockets went back on as well. I used my old timing belt and some vice grips to tighten these bolts up. They're real pain. It's the same procedure as when I took them off. You basically clamp the belt around the pulley to keep it from spinning so you can turn the bolt. Not seen here is me realizing I swapped the set of my cams and put them on the wrong side of the engine. I had to take apart the cam caps and do all that sealing stuff again. Then it was time for the timing system after I bolted some of the pulleys and such on. So I'm now doing the timing. So that mark is pointing straight up. And importantly, that is not top dead center on any cylinders. When that mark is lined up with this mark right here, it means all four pistons are actually in the same depth in the cylinder and none of them are at top dead center. So that's actually good because it means you really can't hit the valves with the piston or vice versa. So that's good. Now I need to line up, I need to line up the single marks so that they point up and then down. And the double marks need to line up, that's good. This side it's really easy because nothing's engaged. There's no valves opening on this side at all. This side is more problematic because the valves are partially engaged on this one and on this one. I simply left the valve cover off so I can see to verify and make sure I'm not going to collide any valves together. You can see this one's engaging a little bit 
and that one's engaging a little bit. They're not engaging both the same cylinder at the same time. And you have to be careful because when you, you need to rotate these cams around, obviously to get them in the right position, but you don't want to rotate them in the wrong direction to reach that position. So for example, if you turn this one left and you start engaging this one, while well, this one's already engaged, to reach the position, that's not good. You have to turn it to the right to make sure you don't cross paths at all on your way to get to the right configuration. Now I think I'm good. I've got single mark up, single mark to the right on this one that's lined up there, and the double marks are both lined up with each other on this side. I'm gonna put on my special fancy locking tool to make sure these don't snap and spin and try and get the new belt on. I follow the factory service manual carefully. Winds up a pulley has to come off to get that belt on. The yellow marks in the belt line up with the cam and crank sprocket so you know it's all aligned properly. Once it goes back on, I can pull the pin out of the tensioner, which tightens up the belt. And with that, the timing is done, and I can move on to the intake manifold. Okay, I'm cleaning up my injectors, and I got my power supply here set to 12 volts. And it's pretty simple. All I'm going to do is use my alligator clips to plug them in. Polarity does not matter. Turn it on the injector up. Spraying some uh, carb cleaner in here and then blast it out. Get a nice healthy spray coming out of there and uh, that should make sure they're pretty clean on the inside. So I got my mess of the intake manifold cleaned up. Replaced a couple fuel hoses that were kind of damaged from taking them off the first time. And I think it's good to go. Got my intake manifold gaskets in. They're kind of tight. They look taller than the old ones, but hey, it's a good seal. So I'm gonna drop it on the engine now. With the intake on, I attach a tiny belt cover followed with the crank pulley. Manual calls out a torque angle for the crank pulley bolt, which I was able to achieve with my pneumatic impact. Then I flipped the engine over and installed the header. I spent a while cleaning this up, and while it isn't polished, it isn't rusty anymore. It did take some persuasion to get it on. Then I installed my engine mounts. These are STI engine mounts, which are actually cheaper than the original ones. You can see the one on the right isn't on properly. I do have a habit of putting engine mounts on backwards. Then I rewrapped my exhaust. This is for sure a tedious process, and I took my time to try and get it as tight as possible. Even then, there were still some loose spots when I was done. And those dang clamps, even with the right tool, they don't work half the time. Now, the only thing left is a clutch, so it should be smooth sailing from here. So, guess what? This is actually the wrong clutch. Now, ultimately, it was a listing mistake by Rally Sport Direct. They listed this clutch as fitting my legacy when it actually doesn't. It is a pull type clutch. You can see from this ring here, throat bearing actually clips into here. When you press the clutch, it pulls on the clutch fingers instead of pushing, um, which is not even the right type for my transmission. I think it might've fit the six speed spec B, but they made no distinction there. So it's the wrong clutch. So I gotta pull it off.
All right, so notice how this one doesn't have any groove inside here because it's a push type clutch and the throat bearing simply pushes on the fingers when it's meant to disengage the clutch. Uh, and it bolts up, it works okay. I was able to reuse the old pilot bearing because it was the same from the other clutch kit. And it's lined up the best I can. So now I'm gonna pop a throat bearing in the transmission and then we can try and drop the motor in. So the clutch is on, the engine is on the hoist, and I'm basically ready to install the engine. The next part, the engine will be going back in and we'll be getting it all hooked up. As always, thanks for watching and feel free to like and subscribe.